because I can hear you on the microphone. Yeah, you don't even have to touch it. Don't touch it. Either. You don't even have to okay. touch it. Okay. Because it can hear you right where you are. Okay. This is kind of hard. The question I'm going to ask you, like I said, is pretty easy. What is church? Church? I don't know. <laughs> I can't. It's too hard. Church? It's like... <sighs> I don't know. I don't know. I think it's a good place to get a donut. And it's a place where I get to play games. Also, there's coffee. Kind of like a hospital. What way is it like a hospital? Uh, helping people. Church is a place where you can remember what God has done for you and connect with people and help them through hard things that they're going through or just help them through good things. Church is where you can learn, you can do stuff and go everywhere you want to. I like Alliance Kids because it always makes church feel shorter. It's a place where you sing and dance and learn about God on every Sunday. Do you dance? No. <laughs> My fav favorite thing at church is to sing and praise the Lord. A place where you'll worship God and sing holy songs. Worshiping is my favorite part because I just love screaming out the word, yelling out the words. It's a house of God. They're not just coming there for just so they could be in heaven, but Christians should go to church so they could actually know what God is like. It's um, almost like a school. The only subject is you, you like learn more and more about Jesus. It's very exciting, and uh, we do a lot of fun stuff with the teachers. Is there another question for me? Church means like the resurrection of Christ. Like, and we worship God there too. They talk about Jesus, and it's very good for kids to learn to to believe in Jesus and to love Jesus. Church is like a place that I can like be myself and worship God. Church is, we sing about Jesus' birthday. Somewhere where you get to go and maybe have some fun activities and learn how to love him. A place you can go to and listen to the Holy Spirit. It makes people learn how to love people even though you sometimes be mean to them, you still love them. Okay. Mm. Actually, Mom, if you want to come over here, then she won't look over that way. You mm. just stand right here, right next to me. Mm. Oh. Church is a place where you can worship and learn new things. We dance and we do everything that I want to do. You can learn about God and make friends and the other stuff that I don't really know. The other day, I didn't get to go because of all the COVID. You know that we had to wear shields too? That was kind of boring. The church is a group of people that come together to worship and love God together. It's a place where you, where you get to hear about God and that's where missionaries are made. I'm learning mostly about the Holy Spirit and how it gives you power. We learn about Jesus and things he did, like he, when he died on the cross for us. Church is where we worship God and then if somebody doesn't know God, we can tell them and they are going to really believe us. Today at church we went up on the balcony and we saw five people getting back to, baptized. They put these people under water and it's called baptism. People are getting baptized from the name of the Lord of Jesus. Some people got vaccinated. What, what does it mean when you get vaccinated? Somebody who gets in a pool and then somebody who puts them back and then they go in the water. They were just dunking in the heads and I don't like to be dunked. Not at all. When you like stand up and like you do this, I don't really do it because I think it's a little embarrassing. When someone's like getting baptized, I'll like stand up and like, if he's my friend, yes, I will go straight away and like say, you go. <laughs> Is there another question? I think it's my favorite thing to do in the week. It's a fun place to be and you learn more each Sunday. In my opinion, it's the best hour of my whole week. 
Yes, finally. Is it hard? Yes, so hard. Bum, bum, bum. <laughs> well, I hope you enjoyed that video as much as I did. A couple things. Number one, church is a great place to get a donut um, and some coffee. Uh, and I promise you, if you, if I ever invite you into the baptismal uh, to uh, celebrate your faith in Christ and be obedient to him uh, in baptism, I promise you I will not vaccinate you there. <laughs> but as you can imagine, our new sermon series is The Church Is, uh, and so I thought that uh, you might enjoy hearing from those acclaimed theologians uh, as we begin our time together today. So let me ask you, how would you answer that question? Uh, if I were to pose it to you, what is church or what is the church? How are some of the ways you might answer that question if uh, somebody sprung a video camera on you and asked you that question? Perhaps we'd answer the question in terms of what we do, because certainly as a church, we do a lot of things, right? Think about just even the things we do weekly. We gather together in this place. We see friends. We, uh, we pray to the Lord. We worship the Lord. We study the scriptures and hear a sermon together. Uh, certainly that's, that's something that's typical of church is that we, we do things and maybe we relate. We'd answer the question in that way. Maybe you'd answer the question in terms of our building, right? This is the place in which we gather together. Uh, perhaps you'd think of a church building in contrast with uh, a mosque or a synagogue or a temple of some sort. Uh, certainly, if somebody says, where are you going on Sunday to church? Uh, maybe you'd answer it in terms of our relationships with one another, and we certainly have wonderful relationships. In fact, this past couple of weeks, as my family and I have been dealing with illness, we were able to experience uh, the church family in a way that we don't often get to experience. We felt your concern. We appreciated your prayers and your encouragement. We saw your support uh, in ways that were relevant to our needs. And perhaps you have had an opportunity to be on the receiving end of that. When, while you've always valued the relationships among this church family, there might have been times when things were particularly hard and you felt your brothers and sisters in Christ coming around you and supporting you in those seasons of life. And so perhaps you'd answer that question, what is church, in terms of the relationships that exist here among your church family? Maybe you'd answer the question by relating it to Jesus. That's always a solid move. But here the question remains then, what do we do about things like the Mormon church or other churches that perhaps view Jesus very differently from how you and I uh, understand Jesus? And so is that all considered church? You know, it might be a difficult question for us, but our society is not pausing at all when it comes to trying to answer that question. There are many voices in our culture that love to answer the question, what is church? Here's some you may have heard as pretty recently on the news or in other ways in which the church is represented. Many would assert that the church is a group of hypocritical moralists holding other people to repressive standards and then failing to live morally themselves. That is a common caricature of the church. Others would say that the church is nothing more than a right-wing political machine bent on stopping any progress that would better humanity. Have you heard that one? And still others would comment that the church is so filled with infighting that it has become frail and it's on the verge of collapse. And so there's really no need to define the church. It's not going to be here much longer. Uh, these are some of the sentiments that our culture is vocal about in answering the question, what is church? And many, both inside the church and outside of the church, probably haven't given the question any thought at all. What is the church? And friends, we have to be able to answer that question. And I'm going to give you three reasons why. First, we are part of the church. And so if we're part of the church, we need to know what it is that we're a part of if we hope to fulfill the mission of the church. Second, our mission is to be used of God to reconcile people to Jesus, which in turn makes them part of the church. And so we'd better know what it is that we're bringing people into as we share the gospel. And third, as 
I just alluded to, the world outside has painted such a caricature of the church that if we're being perfectly honest, it is not appealing to anybody outside of the church. And this has put an obstacle in people's path to hearing and responding positively to the gospel. And so we'd better be able to defend what the church actually is if we hope to help people overcome that caricature and to respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so our summer sermon series is entitled, The Church Is. And so as we go forward over the next several weeks, we'll take a look at a different aspect of what it is, uh, what the church is. And my hope is that we'll have more clarity on this, that we would embrace anew what it means to be part of the church, and that we would have a renewed vigor for our mission as Christ's church. And so again, each week we'll focus on a different aspect. And today I'm going to ease us into this uh, very basically with this topic. The church is Christ's assembly. The church is Christ's assembly. Now what you may not know is that today's sermon title is actually a bit redundant. In essence, what I just said is this. The church is Christ's church. Or the the assembly is Christ's assembly. I think that many Christians believe that God created something new, the church, when Jesus came the first time. However, the word that we translate as church in our English New Testament is actually found 123 times in the Old Testament. Now, raise your hand if you remember reading the Old Testament and seeing the word church pop up. No, because it's translated in the Old Testament as assembly or congregation. And it's the same word that we find in the New Testament that we translate as church. And that's mostly to show a distinction. Um, But it's used again and again throughout the Old Testament to describe the gathering together of God's people. And so when Israel gathered to celebrate a festival or gathered to hear the law of Moses read or gathered for battle, the term used to refer to that assembly of God's people was the same word that we translate as church in our English New Testaments. And that shouldn't surprise us. Uh, God has always called his people to gather together, to worship together, uh, to live life together, uh, to be on mission together, to uphold his name together. And while the fact that God has called out an assembly, a congregation, a church, isn't anything new, There certainly is something new about this particular assembly that God has gathered together in his son's name, Jesus. There is something distinct about the church in light of Jesus' coming. And as part of the church, we better not miss this. And so our text today is from Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 20. And so if you have your Bible with you, feel free to follow along with me. It will be up on the screen. Having my family back means we have the screens again, so that's exciting. In case you thought that my pulpit supply over the last few weeks just didn't bother to put together slides, that's not true. But uh, we're glad to have our technology back. Matthew 16, starting in verse 13, says this. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked. Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. There is so much going on in this passage, and I'm ashamed to say I can't possibly do it any justice this morning. Uh, unless we want to be like some other churches and have a three-hour worship service, which I'm game if you are, but I think some of you would walk out. 
But just to give you an example of how much is in this passage, for instance, the very location that Jesus chose for this dialogue, this area known as Caesarea Philippi, is a place that is known for its worship of the pagan fertility god Pan. And this place literally represented the gates of Hades because this is where that false god Pan supposedly entered and exited the underworld. And it's here, a place where a false god is worshipped, that Jesus asked his followers, Who am I? It's here that Jesus proclaims that the gates of Hades will not overcome the onslaught of Christ's assembly, the church. Another example of the depths of this particular passage is Jesus' wordplay on rock, which you may not get in our English translation, but Peter's name, Petros, literally meant rock. And so in response to Peter's confession, Jesus, in essence, says this, you are rock, and on the rock of your confession which, by the way, is made overlooking the rock of the false god Pan and the entrance to Hades, I will build my church, my assembly. In this wordplay, Jesus implies the centrality of Peter's confession, the important role that Peter and the other apostles most likely would also have, the threat that the church will be to false belief, and the power of the church to rescue people from Hades. And believe me that every single one of those is a sermon in itself. So again, What a wonderful passage. I encourage you to spend time in it. But as we take time today to recognize who we are as the church, as we recognize what it means to truly be Christ's assembly, I want us to see the key to this particular passage, which is in verses 15 and 16. Jesus is asking, he says, But what about you, he asked? Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah the son of the living God. And Jesus responds, on this rock, I will build my church. Christ's assembly, Christ's church, is built on who he is. I'm going to say that again. Christ's assembly is built on who he is. Now, I certainly believe that Christ's assembly is also built on what he has done. Uh, his death and resurrection. We focus all the time on what Jesus has done, and, and, and rightly so. However, the fact of the matter is what he has done cannot be divorced from who he is. This is the foundation of Jesus's assembly, Jesus's congregation, Jesus's church. Unity on the matter of who he is. He is the Messiah, the son of the living God. And what we do with Jesus matters. And we see this over and over again in the scriptures. It mattered for those who lived in Israel when he walked on the earth, and it matters for every other person since that time. In the Old Testament, we see over and over again God calling the assembly of Israel to follow him, to gather before him, to gather in worship of him, to gather in service to him, or in conquest, or in mission, or in ministry, over and over again, God is calling out his assembly to gather for his purposes. And we see this throughout the Old Testament. And now, Jesus has come, as promised, and God is still calling Israel and the nations to him on the foundation of who his son, Jesus, is. And what you do with Jesus matters. I could give you probably 25 to 30 right off the top passages that that speak to this, that what we do with Jesus matters, but I'm going to give you just two of them today. This first one is from the prologue of John's gospel, the very first chapter, and this is what it says in John 1, 11 to 13. It says, he came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, He gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. And so what you do with Jesus matters. To those who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, they had the ability, by God's grace, by the work of Jesus, because of who he is, to become children of God. We see this also very clearly that what we do with Jesus matters in John 14, 6. It says, Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth 
and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And here, Jesus is talking to Jewish people, people who for generations and generations, for a couple thousand years at this point, have had a relationship with God. But he's saying, what you do with me matters because nobody, Jew or Gentile, nobody comes to the Father except through Jesus, the Son. What you do with Jesus matters. And those who are saved, who have been reconciled to God in Jesus, who are part of his assembly, part of his church, are those who believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. This also differentiates us from other groups that might claim to have a relationship with Jesus or claim to be Christian. Uh, it differentiates the Church of Jesus Christ from all other religions, all other philosophies, and again, including the ones that claim to follow Jesus but believe something very, very different about him. Society has long perpetuated the myth that all religions are essentially the same. And this couldn't be farther from the truth. In fact, uh, that sentiment is utter nonsense for numerous reasons. And yet one reason that we see here in our text today is that the true assembly of Jesus are those who believe very specifically the truth claims that Jesus affirms right here in our passage, that he is the Messiah, the son of the living God. All other religions are false if they affirm anything different about Jesus. For instance, there's a lot that other religions have to say about Jesus. Uh, Islam affirms that Jesus was a prophet, but denies that Jesus was the son of the living God. And so it has to be false. Modern Judaism denies that Jesus is the Messiah and denies that Jesus is the son of the living God. And so modern Judaism is also false. Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses deny these things in the way that the Bible clearly affirms them. They believe in a different Jesus, and so they too are not part of Christ's assembly. What you do with Jesus matters, and it matters for us as well. So what does it mean that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God? I'm going to put this very, very simply. In fact, in academia, they would say this is being reductionistic. I might be reducing it too much, but I want to make sure we grab hold of this today. Put very simply, it means this, that Jesus is the divine redeemer. Jesus is the divine redeemer. Let's take this apart at a time. The Messiah simply means anointed one, one anointed by God for a specific task. As an example, the king of Israel throughout the Old Testament is often referred to as God's anointed. In Jesus' day, there was actually a variety of different views regarding the Messiah, who he would be, what he would do when he came. However, what we see over and over again, both in the Old Testament, as well as the first century Jewish expectations of the Messiah, is that he would be a promised king in David's line who would bring about or usher in God's redemption of his people. And so the idea of the Messiah was that he would be anointed of God for the task of ushering in redemption between humanity and God. And yet the idea of Messiah by itself didn't, didn't necessitate that the Messiah be divine, that he be God. And yet this is what the Gospels clearly depict. This is what the uh, epistles clearly state. And there are several passages throughout the Old Testament that also predict that the Messiah would be divine. But here's just some things that Jesus did or said throughout his earthly ministry that put this on display, that he's more than just a man called by God to do special things, but that he is, in fact, the son of the living God, himself divine. Throughout his life, Jesus claimed a special sonship to the Father, distinct from any other person or Israel itself. Jesus referred to his own pre-existence, referring actually to the glory that he shared with the Father before the world was even created. The Gospel of John opens with, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And in verse 14 of that chapter identifies the Word as Jesus. Jesus claims for himself divine prerogatives, things that only God can do. And he claims them for himself, for himself, like forgiveness of sin, like future judgment. 
Paul writes to the Philippians of Jesus not using his divine nature to his own advantage, but making himself nothing by taking on a human nature in order to go to the cross for the salvation of human beings. He was in very nature God and only added on human nature to accomplish God's purposes. And in this moment that we read about in Matthew's gospel, at Caesarea Philippi, as Peter puts all these pieces together, he proclaims the divinity of Jesus, in which he now recognizes and understands. This was a turning point. And therefore, friends, we need to decide carefully what we do with Jesus. If Jesus is just some inspirational historical figure, or mystical guru, or figurehead of a movement, that's just not good enough, according to the text of Scripture, this passage only being one of many. The true church, Christ's assembly, those who assemble in his name for his purposes, it's founded on who he truly is. And so we're not ashamed of it. We proclaim him boldly, and we know that our salvation is only possible because of who he is. And so, friends, it also means that despite our personal distinctions, we are of one assembly, not just with each other, but with all of God's people in Jesus Christ, all of Christ's followers. You know, in the first century, there was a lot of divisiveness, much like what we see in our own culture today. Uh, one of the biggest one probably is just the Jews and Gentiles. Up until that point, the Jews kept themselves apart from the rest of the nations, from those who were not part of Israel, from the Gentiles. And here, what we see in the church in its very beginning, even recorded within the pages of Scripture, is this bringing together of Jews and Gentiles. The cultural barriers that once kept these two people groups apart no longer did because of the gospel, because of who Jesus is. Jews and Gentiles were now brothers and sisters in Christ, both reconciled to God, both anchored to Jesus as Messiah and Son of God, the divine Redeemer. And today, as we look at our world, we see just as much divisiveness uh, as they experienced back in that day, maybe more, who knows. Uh, and yet, the things that divide people ought not to be divisions in the church. Language ought not to divide Age ought not to divide. Gender ought not to divide. Economic class ought not to divide. Race and culture ought not to divide. Political party, yeah, I said that one too, ought not to divide. And any other category that we could think of that divides human beings one from another, they don't have a place in the assembly of God. Assembly is bringing together, it's of like-minded people who belong to Jesus, who stand together on who he is. Friends, it also means that despite theological distinctions, we are also part of one assembly with the true church, wherever they may be, and for all time. Over the, the history of the church, the last 2,000 years, the church has fractured and splintered and divided along mostly theological and methodological lines. And some divisions were warranted. I'm of, I'm of the opinion that the Reformation needed to take place. Uh, but there's also been lots of divisions that were not warranted and yet took place in our, our history. One way or the other, we cannot think of us as one church and them as another church when we think about gospel-centered churches that unite on who Jesus is. We are all of one assembly. I've told some of you this, but for the past several months, Pastor Eric and I, at first, you know, Pastor Eric from First Baptist, we've been getting together regularly for either coffee at Dunkin' Donuts or, uh, or lunch at the Drawbridge, and it's something we plan to continue to do as long as we're able to do. And one of the topics that keeps coming up as we get together is collaboration. And not their collaborate event, but collaboration between our churches. And while we've yet to identify a particular project to collaborate on, one of the things we're often doing as we get together is talking about how, what God is doing in our congregations. What are the specific gifts and skill sets and people that God has brought in? What might God be calling us to? And so we've been sharing our ideas and we've been speaking into one another's uh, uh, ideas. We've been praying for one another. Because, but, but, but why do we do that? I'm not on staff at First Baptist Church. 
Eric's not on staff at the Alliance Church, but it matters to me that Eric and his congregation are successful in living out what God has called them to. And the same is true the other way. It, it should matter to us at Belglade Alliance Church that First Baptist Church and the Lutheran Church and the Methodist Church and the God's people, Christ's assembly, are effectively living out their call. We have a vested interest, one with another, because we may be part of this local church, but we are all part of God's church, Christ's assembly. And friends, the sooner the church at large recognizes that about each other, the sooner that we can work together for the high calling that God has given to us. Because the truth of the matter is, I don't care whether we're talking about Belglade or Manhattan, New York, uh, and any other place in between, there is no one church that could possibly accomplish all that God has for Christ's assembly in any local community without partnering together to do that. And so the church is Christ's assembly. Those who gather together and are anchored on the fact of who he is, as well as what he's done, and are committed to following him in what he has called us to do. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you so much that you have revealed in Scripture who the church is. And we thank you, Lord, that if we profess faith in Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of the living God, believing that what, in what you have accomplished in his death and resurrection, we are part of Christ's assembly. So, Lord, we thank you, first of all, for this local church, for Belglade Alliance Church. But we thank you, Lord, that we are not the church, but we are a part of the whole. And so, Lord, help us to see that. That we have brothers and sisters throughout this community. We have brothers and sisters throughout this world. They may worship different. They may sing songs different than we do. They may believe some different things than we do. Uh, in fact, Lord, we may not get along on a lot of other topics and issues. But, Lord, we are all united on who Jesus is and what Jesus has done and what Jesus is calling his church to. And so, Lord, may we see past ourselves and partner together, network together with the rest of Christ's assembly, both in honoring you and in living out the call that you have for the church in the world. We thank you for these things, and we ask for your blessings on us as we live out our role as part of your church this week as we gather together to continue to reflect on the things you have taught us in Scripture about who we are as the church. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.